Welcome to numerical methods. So now that we know how to calculate or how to approximate our partial derivative with a finite difference, yeah? say for example, just use the forward finite difference, upshifted value minus unshifted value divided by the shift size h. Yeah, we, we would like to take h as small as possible, but there is an issue that creates errors if we take h too small. And I would like to show this to you using a nice numerical experiment where I calculate the partial derivative of a function. And this function that we are looking at is a very simple one. It is the exponential function. Nice thing is that for the exponential function, I know the analytic solution. Yeah? So we already know that the partial derivative yeah, of my function, say if we consider here x0, so this is the derivative of the exponential function at x equals 0. So differentiating the exponential function is just the exponential function at x equals zero. So this is exponential of zero, this is one. So we know the analytic solution. The analytic solution should be one if we calculate now the partial derivative of the exponential function at the point x equal zero. So numerical experiment, calculate partial derivative of the exponential function at zero. We will use double precision floating point numbers. And here you find a few suggestions for shift sizes. So to speed up a little bit, let's just look here at the code in our repository, but I will go step by step through this code. Yeah, you find this code in our lecture repository here in the package that is called finite difference. Yeah, it's called the finite difference experiment. So let's have a look at this code. So my lecture repository, there is a package called finite difference, and there is here the finite difference experiments. Yeah, and you find here several calculations that are done with different shift sizes. So let me for a moment comment all these guys out so that we can step through it. Okay. And maybe just look at the first one. So I have a function print forward finite difference approximation of exponential function. And this uh, function takes two arguments. It takes the x and the shift size that I would like to use. So the function is here below. So it's take the x and the shift size that we would like to use. The function that we are looking at is the exponential function. So let's calculate the finite difference approximation. So I use the forward finite difference approximation. So calculate the upshifted value, exponential function at x plus h. So here calculate the unshifted value. This is just exponential function at x. And then calculate the forward finite difference. So this is upshifted value minus unshifted value divided by the shift size. So this is my numerical method. This is the numerical approximation. We do know the analytic solution. The analytic solution is just exponential of x. In my case, since we will pass here x equals zero, it will be one, no, but just having it here more general, it's exponential at x. The error is then the finite difference approximation minus the analytic solution. Yeah? So the error is the difference of the two, and I just print the result. So let's check this with a shift of 0.01. So I just run this little program. And you see my shift is a 10 to the minus 2 yeah, and 0.01. And my approximation is a 1.005. So if you now subtract the one, the analytic solution, you have an error of 0 0.005 and a little bit more something. So recall what should be the error. 
So forward finite difference. The error is second derivative at some intermediate point. So my point is now between zero and h, yeah, x and x plus h. So this is between zero and h. So this is close to zero. The second derivative is also the exponential function. So this is exponential of something that is close to zero. This is something that is close to one, yeah, not exactly one, but close to one times h half. And you see that we have exactly this. Yeah, This here is h half, 0 0.005 is h half. And then I have a little bit more yeah, because I have this second derivative in front at an intermediate point that is not exactly yeah, at uh, zero. Yeah, maybe let's make the shift smaller. Huh? Okay, let's make the shift smaller. 0, 0, 1, yeah, so a 10 to the minus 3, and I get 1 half 10 to the minus 3, 5 times 10 to the minus 4 is the error term. That is completely in line here with our formula. Let's make the shift smaller again. So I have now a 10 to the minus 4. Uh, so you see I get here a 1, yeah, already the error is out here of my printing range, but I do have an error. It is a one half times 10 to the minus four, yeah, plus something a little bit in addition, yeah, a five times 10 to the minus five. Clearly, this suggests to take the shift as small as possible. So let's be a little bit brutal and take now a very, very small shift. So maybe you recall there is here this constant min normal, yeah? So this is a constant holding the smallest positive normal value of type double, yeah? So the smallest possible floating point number, yeah, that is a normal one. So this is something like a two times 10 to the minus 308. Let's use this shift. Okay, now you are fine. A different approximation gives you a zero. Note the solution is one, yeah? so I'm far away from one. Of course, my error is now a zero minus one. My error is now a one. Yeah? So I made the shift very, very small, yeah? and the final difference calculation here completely breaks down. Okay, maybe that shift was way too small because it is the smallest value that the computer can represent. Let's take a different one. Let's take a 10 to the minus 16. So if you take to the 10 to, if you take a 10 to the minus 16, the same happens. Yeah. The final difference approximation gives you a zero. The error is a minus one. Yeah. So this error here is larger than anything that, that you have observed before. Well, 10 to the minus 16 is the machine precision. Yeah? Maybe we are too close to that. Let's take a 10 to the minus 15. Okay. Now I get an approximation, yeah? so I get something that is close to one, but the error is huge. I have a 10% error. My error is 0.11. It's larger than anything that we have had before. So let's take a 10 to the minus 14. Yeah? So this is approximately a 10 to the minus three. Yeah? So I still have an error, and you still see that the error is larger than these two guys here. And you also see now a strange effect. If I make the shift larger, the error gets smaller. Okay, if I make the shift larger, the error gets smaller. Let's try different shifts. Yeah? Let's try 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 8. Yeah? Let's try larger and larger shifts. And you see that this pattern persists. Yeah. So for a 10 to the minus 12 in shift size, my error is here an 8 times 10 to the minus 5. For 10 to the minus 10, my error is a 8 times 10 to the minus 8. For a 10 to the minus 8 in the shift size, yeah, a larger shift, my error is now a 6 times 10 to the minus 9. Okay, so... It appears as if I should really choose a large shift size, a larger shift size. And the optimal shift is maybe somewhere in between this guy here yeah, and that guy here. So note that this guy here yeah, is now 
better than what you have observed here, but still here the error has becoming smaller if you increase the shift size. Uh, and here, if you come from the other side, the error has become smaller if you decrease the shift size. So what, what's going on there? To have a better understanding of what is going on there, let's plot this error uh, as a function of a shift. So I will skip a little bit here this code and you see that I have here another function that is called plot forward finite difference approximation error. Yeah? And this guy takes now three arguments, the value X at which we would like to differentiate the function and then a range. So this is not the range of the shift. If we go to this function here, it's here. So this range is the range of the scale because you see that here I went in powers of 10. Yeah? So I went from 10 to the minus 16 to 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 3. So let's consider plotting the error as a function of the power uh, in my 10 to the minus scale. Yeah? So this means I have a minimum scale and a maximum scale and I would like to plot now from 10 to the minus 16.5 to say, for example, a 10 to the minus 14. Or let's take the second one, yeah, which is a larger range, a 10 to the minus 20 to a 10 to the minus one. Okay, so I pass here the two bounds for my scale and I define now the function Give me the error for a given scale. So you see that here below, this is exactly the same code as we have before. Yeah? So there's a certain shift here that enters. Yeah? Calculate the upshifted value, calculate the unshifted value, calculate the finite difference, upshifted minus unshifted divided by shift size, calculate the analytic solution, calculate the error as the difference of the finite difference approximation and the analytic solution. Then return this error. So here the shift is calculated as a 10 to the power of scale. And now scale runs from, say for example, minus 16 to minus one. Then plot this function. So I have here some code that plots this function. So let's run this plotting code now, say with a scale running from 10 to the minus 20 to a 10 to the minus one. So we have many different shift sizes, many different scales. Okay, and I get this plot. So you see that here's my approximation error. I would like to have an error of zero. Huh? So I would like to be here at the green line. You also see this error of minus one, yeah, which we had here for very small shift sizes. So you see there's a constant line with a minus one, but then suddenly something is going on and you see the error is oscillating here and it's becoming smaller as you increase the number of shifts. But then on the other side, yeah, the error is becoming larger. And if you zoom in here, you see the error is suddenly increasing. You know? So this is the higher order effect you, know? you get from having a too large shift size. Yeah? So this is the error that you get from the mathematical formula, your residual term. But what's this guy here? Okay, so I would like to have a closer look at this guy here. So maybe I would like to have a scale from minus 16.5 to say some minus 14. So let's create this picture again with a scale that is now focusing on this left part where I use very small shifts. So let's run the program again. This is the full scale. And this is now the scale yeah, from minus 16.5. So a shift of 10 to the minus 16.5 to a minus 14, so a shift of a 10 to the minus 14. Okay, so you see the strange oscillating behavior. Okay, so you also have this plot in your script. And now my question, do we understand why he is generating 
this picture, so why he has these approximation errors. Yeah, to understand this, let's recall what is the error. The formula for the error as a function of the shift size, which we use, is, okay, we take the finite different approximation. So it is exponential of h, yeah? so exponential of x plus h, but x is zero, minus exponential of zero, yeah? exponential of x, yeah? exponential of zero is one, divided by h. This is my finite difference approximation. And from that, I subtract the analytic solution of the partial derivative, so minus one. This is not completely true, because what we do is we implement this stuff in the computer, and there is an additional part. The exponential function is implemented in the computer and it is rounded to floating point numbers. And in this rounding, so in this function float, there is now suddenly an error. And you now divide this error by h. This means that if h is small, this error becomes larger. But this is what is going on here. So this nicely links back to our very first session in this lecture, on floating point arithmetic. That's why I believe it is so important that you have seen this, you know, because if you just do this now plainly in your master thesis or in a research project and believe that, okay, let's choose a very small shift size to approximate the derivative, you get completely unreasonable result. And sometimes you don't have the analytic solution to check if your result is reasonable. Yeah? So you don't even know that all your calculation is completely crap. So let's think a little bit of what is going on here. So I like to choose very small shift sizes. If the shift is small, then I know that the exponential function of h, yeah, of my shift, is between 1 and, say, for example, 2. So this means I know the floating point representation of the result. Yeah? So the exponential h is now rounded to a normalized floating point number. So recall that we do know how the computer represents floating point numbers. Okay. Surprise, we move back to definition one. This is my normalized floating point number. And the computer is representing this normalized floating point number as some exponent, some scale here. But then I have a 1 plus c divided by 2 to the power of q, where for double precision floating point number, recall the q was a 52. So I know that if I'm between 1 and 2, the exponent e here is equal to a zero, and the result of the exponential function rounded to a floating point number is a one plus c divided by two to the power of q. So we know what happens if we take the exponential function of a small shift. We know that the shift is so small that we are between one and two with the exponential function. If we then apply the rounding to the nearest floating point number, that floating point number is a one plus C divided by two to the power of Q, where we know the Q is a 52 for double precision floating point numbers. So there is some rounding. So this means if you increase the h, you will get, due to the rounding, always the same result here, unless the value is rounded to the next floating point number. Yeah. This then will introduce such a jump. Okay, so the value of this guy here increases because it is rounded to the next floating point number and you will jump up.
if you approximate the exponential function by one plus h, yeah? so now the true solution of exponential h is approximately one plus h, I have on the left-hand side the h, but on the right-hand side, I have my representation as a normalized floating point number. So I have that one plus h is rounded to one plus c divided by two to the power of q. This means that the h is a c divided by two to the power of q for some c plus or minus some rounding error, which is between minus one half divided by two to the power of q and plus one half two to the power of q. So this is my rounding error. This also means that I have no rounding error if h is exactly equal to c divided by two to the power of q. Because this then means that my exponential function is exactly a one plus c divided by two to the power of q. Let's look at this picture and you see there is a point where you have no rounding error. It is here. Okay, if my considerations are correct, this value here should correspond to a shift that is a C, say the smallest one, one, divided by two to the power of 52. So this means that the scale in my experiment here, yeah, the scale, note the scale is the logarithm base 10 of my shift. Yeah? The scale is logarithm base 10 of the shift size. Let's maybe just calculate this. Okay, I have a small calculator here. So I would like to have a one divided by two to the power of 52, okay? This is my two times 10 to the minus 16. And from there, the base 10 logarithm. This is a minus 15.65. Uh, this is the location that we have here. Minus 15.65. Indeed, yeah, if the shift size is one divided by two to the power of 52, we have no rounding error in the exponential function and the Find a different approximation is correct. Maybe we can check this in our experiment. So let's continue here with looking at different shifts. So let's have here a look at that one. This is a two to the power of minus 52. And a small line to have nicer output. And you see we get an exact value with an error of zero. Well, this is to some extent now a coincidence, yeah, which depends on the exponential function. We also understood where the jump comes from. The jump comes from rounding yeah, to the next floating point number. So this happens when the h is becoming larger yeah, than an floating point number plus one half divided by two to the power of 52. Yeah? So at these points here, yeah, at the points where I have a C plus one half divided by two to the power of 52, there I will round to the next floating point number. If our reasoning is correct, this point here should be the point where h is 0.5 divided by two to the power of 52. You can also maybe check this in the calculator. 0.5 divided by two to the power of 52. This is now my one times 10 to the minus 16. Take the logarithm base 10. Now, this is a scale of minus 
a minus 15.95. Yeah? Okay, that's exactly the point where we jump when we round to the next floating point number. Okay, so this thing is happening because the computer can represent many different values, h. Yeah? h is a small number, but you know he can represent many different small numbers. The smallest one is a 10 to the minus 308. Yeah? He can represent many different sm small numbers between c divided by 2 to the power of q and c plus 1 divided by 2 to the power of q. So this is what he can do on the argument side. But for the result of the exponential function, yeah, he can only represent a limited amount of numbers. And these numbers are now numbered by the integer c. Yeah? So at a certain point, we will move from 1 plus c divided by 2 to the power of q to the next one the 1 plus c plus 1 divided by 2 to the power of q. So in all these numbers that are here between 1 half divided by 2 to the power of q and 1 plus 1 half divided by 2 to the power of q, all these numbers are rounded to the same value when we look at the result of the exponential functions. All these numbers are rounded here to the same value, namely to 1 plus 1 divided by 2 to the power of q. There is a single number which is represented by the correct result here. Yeah? So there is a single argument h that gives me the correct result. This is if I take here exactly 1 divided by 2 to the power of q. So this is the point that we have here, the green dot. At the orange line here, we jump. At the orange line, we jump and all the results that are now below this orange line, so all results that are below one half divided by two to the power of q, they are rounded back to one. All these results here are rounded back to one. Yeah. So which is exponential of zero. Yeah. So which is the only right value for exponential zero. So if they are rounded back to one, your finite difference is zero. Yeah. This one is rounded back to one minus one divided by whatever h you took. Yeah, this is a zero. Your final difference approximation is a zero. So your error is a minus one. This gives me here this line where all these values suddenly have a minus one as the error. The next jump is at the value h is 1.5 divided by 2 to the power of 52. Okay, so you can check that this is the location. And the next value that has no rounding error is this one here. So this is the value where my shift size is 2 divided by 2 to the power of 52. So this is the value which then gives a 1 plus 2 divided by 2 to the power of 52, yeah, so all these values here are rounded to, to this guy. So now you have a good understanding for this picture here. And what's happening in between? Yeah, in between you have, of course, still the division here by h, yeah? So you have something that looks like a 1 divided by h. So you have a 1 divided by h, and then you have a rounding in the floating point arithmetic, and you have this, this jump. What is the jump size? OK, so we have a jump at values where my h is just in between. So this means I have a c plus 1 half divided by 2 to the power of q. So my c is in between two integer values divided by 2 to the power of q. So this is where I have a jump. So I jump actually from 
a minus one half to a plus one half. So I jump rounding error. So rounding error change, say rounding error change. So this is a one divided by two to the power of Q. This is my jump. Yeah, I round, I get to the next integer Z divided by H. Yeah? So divided by H. So this is the jump size. So this jump size is equal one divided by two to the power of Q divided by H. So divided by C plus one half divided by two to the power of Q. So this is actually a one divided by C plus one half. Okay, maybe just write it as two divided by C, two C plus one. So this is the jump size. So for C equals zero, you have a jump size of two, yeah? two divided by one. You see that this is true. Yeah? I jump from minus one to one. I have a jump size of two. For C equals one, I have a jump size of two divided by three. Yeah? So two times one third. Okay, this is true because you jump from minus one third to plus one third. minus one over three to plus one over three. So, and so on. Yeah? So the next jump will get from minus one over five to plus one over five. Let's maybe verify this in our computer. Okay, let's also look at the values at one half, yeah? one divided by two to the power of 52. Yeah? or say a little bit less than one half and a little bit more than one half. Okay, and you see, I jump from minus one to one. Okay, so that is actually the first jump. And maybe also the next one. Yeah, The next one will be at 1.5. Yeah? And we jump to one divide by three, yeah? So if you would like to uh, see the point that is before, let's take maybe here 1.1549. So you'd see that you jump from minus one divided by three to plus one divided by three. Okay, so now you have an understanding for this picture here. Yeah? And you see that there is a good reason to choose a large shift size. So what is now the optimal shift size? So in the script, you find the remarks that I just made and also here the calculation that I did in this little calculator. So you have a certain value where you have zero approximation error. So this is whenever your shift H is just equal to a C, an integer number C divided by two to the power of Q, yeah, then you have zero approximation error. So that was at these points. And we have the other points where we have some approximation error. So this is, for example, when we have these jumps, yeah, uh, C equals one half or C equals 1.5, then we have the jumps yeah, due, due to the rounding at the next level. Yeah? And you can verify that these are now the quantities that you see here in this picture. Yeah? There, there, or here for the next, next jump. Okay, so we can now discuss what is actually the optimal shift size. And we have to do some calculations to get a good error estimate. This error estimate is now composed of two parts. So there is one part that comes from the Taylor expansion, which means I would like to take small shifts. Yeah? I have an error that is order of H and let's make H small. And there's another part that comes from computer arithmetic. Yeah? I have an error due to rounding. This error due to rounding is here. And you see that this error has an order of 
1 divided by h. So this part would like to have the h large. So you have something with a 1 divided by h and something with an h, and you would like to find now the optimal h. Turns out we can calculate this, but let's do this in the next session. And I would just like to conclude with showing you on a single slide the approximation of the second order derivative because we already did this yeah, and you already know how to do it. You use our Taylor expansion. In this case, I can go to n equal three. So there's so actually, in this case, I can go to n equal 3. So there's an additional cancellation here. But I just need two equations. So if you use n equal 3 and you use now an upshift and a downshift, you have that the upshifted value minus the unshifted value is the first derivative multiplied with the shift size h, the second derivative multiplied with the shift size h squared half, the third derivative multiplied with the shift size h to the power of 3, yeah, and I used n equal 3, so my residual term is now a term with a fourth derivative times h to the power of 4 divided by 24. Then I use this also with a minus h. So I have just here the downshifted value minus the unshifted value. And now everything where h is replaced with a minus h. So first derivative with multiplied with minus h. Second derivative multiplied with minus h squared half, but minus h squared is just h squared. Third derivative multiplied with minus h to the power of 3 divided by 6. So this gives a minus h to the power of 3 divided by 6. And a residual term. So this is maybe now a different residual term because it is valued at a different intermediate point. And now you see if you, instead of subtracting these two equations, what we did for the first derivative, if you add the two equations, yeah, because you have a plus here and a minus here. So if I now add the two equations, the first order term cancels and the second order term remains. And the funny thing is that you could also do this with n equals 2. Yeah, and you get now a residual term that has an h to the power of 3. There will be two residual terms being left because they both have a different intermediate point. But you see that you get an additional order for 3 because the third derivative term by coincidence also cancels. So this is why I used n equal to 3 yeah, because this guy also cancels. And we have a little bit for free, a higher order in the error term. Again, you can replace these two values here at two different points with just a single one at a single point. I would like to have an approximation formula for my second derivative. So I have that these guys here already cancelled. I move my error term to the other side. If I add the two. So what I need is I have to divide by h squared. So this makes the h to the power of 4, which we have here, h squared divided by 12. So I have an error term h squared divided by 12, multiplied with the fourth derivative. In my approximation error formula for the second derivative of the function v with respect to x, the final difference is given by adding these two here. So this means I have the upshifted value 
minus two times the unshifted value of the function plus the downshifted value. Okay, and I divided by h squared. So if you add the two, the coefficient that you have here is just an h squared. So divide by h squared. Okay, this is yeah, maybe the well-known approximation formula for the second derivative. Yeah? And you have here an error term that is again small if h is small. And it is of order h squared, yeah? So we got an additional order, yeah? You would have expect order h, yeah? But you got an additional order due to the lucky thing that this guy is also canceling. You can calculate the first order and second order derivative from the same valuation functions. So you see that these guys here are exactly the guys that we need for the centered finite difference of the first order derivative. Yeah? So you just need the three valuations, upshift, downshift, and the function, the unshifted value, to get the first and second order derivative, with both with an order h squared error. That was it for today. Thanks.